Hello, I'm delighted to be here and I'd like to begin by thanking the organizers for inviting me to participate in this World TV Day uh, conference. And I'm very sorry I can't be there in person. Today I'll be speaking about advances in TB preventive therapy, uh, taking a somewhat global uh, perspective. So I'll begin by asking the question, why treat TB infection? Um, often it's a chicken or egg question. Do we treat the disease? Do we treat the infection? Why do we treat the infection? And the answer is because all TB disease arises from TB infection. You can't have disease without the infection. And by treating the infection, we can control the incidence of the disease and reduce the incidence of disease. Now, over the past couple of years, we spent a lot of time focusing on interventions to bend the curve. Well, I wanna show you the example of how TB preventive therapy bends the curve. These are data from the Bethel INH prevention study done by Dr. George Comstock and colleagues in the US Public Health Service back in the late 1950s and early 1960s. Tuberculosis was epidemic and endemic at that time in the Eskimo population in Alaska uh, with very high rates of disease, 2% uh, per year um, developing TB. That's 2,000 per 100,000. Uh, and um, <clears throat> Dr. Comstock did a study where he randomized the population of the entire region to get either INH or placebo for a year. And what he showed is that after one year, those who got INH had a 70% reduction in the risk of tuberculosis, and over uh, five subsequent years had a 60% overall lower rate of TB. But what you can see is that giving uh, INH preventive therapy to half the population helped drive down tuberculosis in the other half of the population who didn't get INH. And this is the bending of the curve. It's secondary transmissions that were prevented by giving uh, INH preventive therapy. And so this is a very good example of why it is uh, so useful to treat TB infection and not wait for disease to develop. Now it's well recognized that treating TB infection is an important part of the NTB strategy. Uh, and here you have a summary from the WHO of both the uh, sustainable development goals and the uh, NTB strategy. And that includes these statements made at the United Nations in 2018 that the countries of the world committed themselves to treating at least 30 million people with TB preventive therapy over the five years from 2018 to 2022. And this included 6 million people with HIV, uh, 4 million young children uh, under age five who are household contacts, and 20 million people who are otherwise household contacts over the age of five. So it's recognized as an important part of the NTB strategy. However, <clears throat> Progress towards these goals has been poor. Uh, overall, we see that uh, of that uh, um, 30 million people, we've only reached 8.7 million. Uh, the WHO reports that we've done very well with uh, people living with HIV with over 7 million given TB preventive therapy, but we're doing terribly with household contacts under five and abysmally with household contacts over the age of five. Uh, so progress is lagging. Um, the HIV numbers are likely overestimated, as I'll show you in a moment. Uh, children under five are lagging badly and household contacts over five are completely neglected. So we really need to do much better. Why do I say that the HIV numbers are uh, overreported or exaggerated? Well, here are data published uh, by the CDC in 2020, looking at the uptake of TB preventive therapy in PEPFAR programs, where it was mandated that TB preventive therapy be done. And you can see over several different uh, time periods among people who are initiating uh, antiretroviral uh, therapy, a very tiny proportion of them receive TB preventive therapy. And if PEPFAR programs aren't delivering TB preventive therapy, it's highly unlikely that uh, other programs are doing much better. What about treatment of 
uh, exposure to TB in uh, children. This is uh, from a study led by uh, Nicole Salazar Austin uh, at Johns Hopkins, working with colleagues in South Africa, looking at household contacts of TB, adult TB cases in Clarksdorp, South Africa, and showing the cascade of care. And what you can see is that this was a randomized trial looking at two different uh, strategies for reaching these children. But of the household contacts that existed, only half were identified uh, and brought to the clinic. Uh, and uh, only half of those uh, were effectively screened. Uh, most of those who were screened were started on INH preventive therapy in this case, but uh, there was very low completion rates. So the overall cascade of care results in only 11% of these children exposed to a TB case in their household uh, being uh, given a course of TB preventive therapy. So <clears throat> what's the problem? Well, there's been lots of problems over the years. There are challenges with uh, toxicity of treatment, isoniazid uh, toxicity, poor adherence to treatment. There's been fear of resistance uh, emerging uh, from TB preventive therapy, though there's been no evidence of that. Um, there's a concern that it won't be effective against reinfection, especially for people with living, living with HIV. And there's been a real lack of understanding of the impact of treating TB infection on TB dynamics. But as we look back to the 1960s and the work in Alaska, it's clear that TB preventive therapy has a profound impact on TB dynamics. So what can we do to make things better? Well, we can find safer regimens that have less toxicity, shorter regimens, <clears throat> uh, and perhaps even long acting injectables. We have to rule out active TB first so we don't end up with uh, the, uh, monotherapy or inadequate therapy for active disease. We have to be able to use it with antiretroviral therapy, but we have to be able to evaluate and appreciate the population level impacts of TB preventive therapy. Over the course of uh, a dozen years or so, uh, my colleagues and I uh, <clears throat> working around the world um, developed one new short course regimen, 3-HP, uh, weekly rifapentine and isoniazid. And in three uh, clinical trials showed that weekly rifapentine and INH, uh, 3-HP was non-inferior or almost superior to isoniazid in uh, adults adolescents and children, including uh, people living with HIV infection. It was safer overall than INH or than another short course regimen, rifampin and PZA, and it had better adherence and treatment completion. And the reason it had better adherence and treatment completion is pretty obvious. The shorter the regimen, uh, the easier it is to complete. And so here we see uh, the proportion of patients in uh, this largest trial, three months of INH uh, versus nine months of uh, three months of uh, um, rifapentine and INH versus nine months of INH. Um, the rate of discontinuation was actually a little higher with the 3HP arm, but it was finished faster. So uh, the people who were taking INH for nine months had a lot more time uh, to stop treatment and they stopped treatment uh, uh, more because they got tired of it uh, than because it was, uh, it was toxic. So what about repeated courses of preventive therapy? What about reinfection? There's a serious worry that people had that people living with HIV um, would get reinfected and that a single round of uh, TB preventive therapy would not be successful. And that led to the WIP TB study led by Gavin Churchard from the Orem Institute uh, in South Africa, published uh, uh, last uh, summer, uh, northern summer. Um, and this was a randomized trial that uh, compared uh, a single round of 3HP given once to annual rounds of 3HP uh, given once and then repeated at a year. There's also a small control group of uh, people getting six months of INH uh, and only followed for uh, a year. So this study um, showed that first of all, completion of uh, the 3HP round, uh, rounds was much greater than uh, completion of INH. Shorter regimens are easier to take. So 90% completion of um, uh, 3-HP versus 50% completion of isoniazid. Uh, 
But what it also showed was that the second round of uh, 3-HP for those who received it didn't provide any benefit. And these are the rates of TB that occurred in those who um, received either one or two rounds of 3-HP. And you see there's just absolutely no uh, difference um, uh, between the two regimens. Uh, this is looking at death. And there's a slight difference uh, in rates of death with the people who got two rounds having a slightly higher rate of death, but this was not uh, at all statistically um, significant. Um, so <clears throat> um, we can conclude that a single round of TB preventive therapy for people living with HIV who are receiving antiretroviral therapy is effective, and we don't need to worry about giving uh, uh, multiple rounds of treatment. Well, what about drug interactions? We know 3-HP is safe with the Favarin's that was shown long ago. What about uh, giving 3-HP with dolutegravir, which is now the most uh, commonly used uh, antiretroviral backbone drug around the world? So in the Dalton study, uh, we looked at um, co-administration of uh, 3-HP and dolutegravir uh, in people with HIV. And what we found uh, in this, in this uh, PK study is that there was a modest decline in the dolutegravir AUC. Uh, overall, about you can see about a 30% reduction in the AUC, uh, but the uh, trough levels remained adequate for almost all of the participants. And all of the participants um, maintained a viral load that was uh, less than 40 copies throughout their treatment with uh, 3-HP while on once a day dolutegravir. Um, and so the conclusion is that 3-HP can be given safely to patients taking both dolutegravir uh, or uh, afferens without any dose adjustment. Uh, another short course uh, regimen uh, that has been shown to be effective in uh, adults and children is four months of rifampin. Um, and this was compared to nine months of isoniazid in uh, a study led by Dick Menzies from McGill University. And both in the adult trial and in the pediatric trial, um, the four months of rifampin was not inferior to the um, uh, uh, nine months of INH and uh, uh, it was safe uh, and well tolerated. In fact, it was safer than nine months uh, of INH. <clears throat> um, subsequently, we've shown that one month of rifapentine uh, and INH or 1HP is non inferior to nine months of INH in people living with HIV. And here are the overall data showing that in people with HIV in high burden settings, um, there's no difference in rates of TB in those who received one month of rifapentine and INH versus nine months of um, uh, isoniazid. You can see the incidence rates here, and this was easily non-inferior. In that subset of individuals who had <coughs> a proven latent infection, <coughs> excuse me, uh, that is who had a positive PPD or IGRA test, again, uh, clearly non-inferior um, with slightly higher rates in those receiving INH than those uh, receiving uh, 1HP. <clears throat> what about giving 1HP with antiretroviral drugs? Well, we showed that um, co-administration of 1HP with the favarins um, uh, did not uh, affect the trough concentrations of afavirenz uh, <clears throat> and uh, didn't affect the clearance uh, of afavirenz. So afavirenz can be given with 3HP, uh, 1HP rather, with, without dose adjust adjustment. And recently at Croy, uh, several weeks ago, Anthony Padani uh, and his team from the ACTG presented the results of ACTG um, A5372, which looked at co-administration of 1-HP and dolutegravir. And in this study, uh, the uh, participants were given twice daily um, uh, dolutegravir while they were receiving a once daily uh, rifapentine and INH for a month and underwent intensive uh, pharmacokinetic and sparse PK sampling during that um, uh, one month of uh, treatment. Uh, and what they found was that um, uh, with the twice daily dosing, uh, all of the participants maintained uh, uh, concentrations, trough concentrations that were well above the cut point for the effective dose that was seen in the early um, uh, trials of dolutegravir uh, alone. Uh, and you can see that over time, in fact, the uh, concentrations went up slightly in this group, but um, 
no individual uh, had a trough concentration that was below what's considered uh, the uh, cut point for an effective uh, dose, uh, an expect effective exposure to uh, dolutegravir. The team is now uh, modeling the data to see if they can go on and give once daily dolutegravir uh, and uh, uh, safely suppress patients uh, uh, co-treated co for uh, latent TB and um, uh, HIV, uh, but currently we can say that twice daily dolutegravir can be given to people getting 1HP. So what are we going to do about all these new regimens that we have? Well, this is uh, work that's funded by Unitaid, uh, led by the Orem Institute uh, and partnered with Johns Hopkins, KNCV, uh, TAG and the Clinton uh, Health Access uh, Initiative. Uh, and this Impact for TB uh, project is uh, scaling up 3HP and now 1HP uh, in a dozen countries uh, around the world, uh, targeting particularly people living with HIV and um, uh, children who are household contacts. Uh, and uh, over the course of the last four years, uh, the Impact for TB team has been able to negotiate a price reduction of rifapentine from $72 to $15, uh, increased generic production, uh, and uh, conduct a number of important uh, operational uh, implementation studies looking at choice architecture and uh, home-based contact evaluations. And then this the Dalton study that I told you about, which is being followed by a, a suite of Dalton studies looking at uh, 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 dolutegravir uh, and rifapentine in pregnant women, dolphin mums, and uh, in children. And importantly, um, there is now an FDC, a fixed dose combination of 3HP that has 300 milligrams of uh, INH and 300 milligrams of rifapentine, uh, making um, co-administration uh, simpler uh, for both 3HP and uh, 1HP. Now, an important issue that uh, we haven't uh, yet gotten a clear answer on is how to treat uh, latent TB in people with exposure to MDR-TB. And there are three uh, trials uh, addressing this, the TB-CHAMP study in South Africa, looking at levofloxacin in young children uh, exposed to MDR in the household, the VQIN study in Vietnam, uh, looking at uh, levofloxacin versus placebo in uh, older individuals, uh, exposed to MDR and the Phoenix study uh, that led by the ACTG and the impact network looking at household contacts of MDR-TB. Um, uh, the TB-CHAMP uh, study is uh, uh, near completion. VQIN uh, is uh, very near completion and perhaps you'll hear about it from another speaker at this uh, conference. And the Phoenix study uh, still has uh, a little bit uh, longer to go. So we don't currently have an answer for what to do with people exposed to MDR-TB. So over the past uh, half century, we've done a remarkable job of shortening the course of preventive therapy going from 15, 12 months, uh, 50 years ago, uh, down to nine months, uh, 20 years ago, down to uh, three months, uh, 10 years ago, and uh, now just a couple of years ago, getting it down to uh, one month. So really incredible progress has been made. Um, but should we stop there? Should we be satisfied or can we do any, even better? Can we make it uh, shorter? Can we go down uh, uh, from uh, one month to perhaps once a single injection? Uh, what about long acting injectables? We know that long acting injectables are highly effective for the treatment and prevention of HIV. Could we develop long acting injectable formulations of TB drugs that might be um, effective as a single shot therapy for uh, TB infection. Well, work done by Eric Nurberger and colleagues at Janssen uh, have shown in a mouse model uh, that a single injection of a long acting injectable formulation of uh, bedaquiline in mice maintains therapeutic levels for over three months. Um, and so this is uh, highly promising as a treatment that uh, uh, if a human um, formulation is developed, uh, could be used to treat um, latent TB in, um, in humans. And in a, pu a publication that just came out uh, a week ago, uh, Eric Nornberger and his colleagues showed in the mouse model of latent TB, 
that the uh, that a single injection of bedaquiline was as effective in uh, reducing uh, bacterial load as one month of rifapentine uh, and uh, isoniazid. Now this is a mouse model, but this mouse model has predicted every shorter course regimen that we've developed over the last 30 years. And so the red dots here are the 1HP and the light blue are a single injection of uh, bedaquiline in this uh, mouse model. And it takes a little longer to uh, reduce the bacterial load, but a single injection does just as well as a month of daily uh, 1 HP and two injections uh, does even better. So this is extremely promising uh, as a future treatment that we might uh, be able to give patients. Um, so where are we now? We have a lot of options. We have uh, nine uh, or six months of, of INH. We have four months of rifampin, uh, three months of rifampin and INH. We have 3HP and we have 1HP. They're all endorsed by the WHO and the CDC or the US Public Health Service. And we know how to use them with uh, or not use them with uh, most antiretroviral drugs that are currently in use. So I'd like to just finish by emphasizing how important it is to treat latent TB, to treat TB infection, and just give you a couple of examples. So this is from an essay published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2015 from a group in Seattle. And they report that um, by using uh, one HP, three HP rather, um, given weekly, they were able to um, essentially end an outbreak of tuberculosis in uh, homeless individuals um, in King County, uh, Washington. They partnered with a community group and with a bakery. Uh, they brought the uh, uh, individuals who needed the uh, preventive therapy to the bakery every Saturday, fed them uh, some uh, pastries and coffee and gave them their 3HP. And you can see by doing this, they uh, essentially eliminated this outbreak of uh, tuberculosis in the homeless population. population. Another example is in uh, Northern Canada in Nunavut uh, in the Inuit population there uh, that had high rates of, um, of tuberculosis uh, and where there was an outbreak of TB in this uh, very rural, very remote population. Uh, and uh, because of the difficulties of giving nine months of INH, they elected to give 3HP. Um, and what they showed was that overall, the uptake of 3HP in these two communities compared to INH was a slightly better, not hugely better, but the completion rates were certainly better, uh, even though they were not statistically significant, the numbers are small, but they're considerably better completion rates of uh, <clears throat> in the um, uh, uh, low to mid 70s versus 65%. Uh, but they then did some economic modeling, uh, and what they showed was that the use of 3HP in this setting uh, was consistently more effective and cost-saving compared to using the old standard of care, nine months of uh, INH. And then finally, uh, work done by my colleague Kunchak Dorji and uh, individuals at the uh, uh, Central Tibetan uh, Administration in Dharamsala, India, looked at uh, intervention in um, school children, Tibetan refugee school children who have high rates of both latent TB and active TB, and a comprehensive uh, program of screening school children and offering TB preventive therapy with a short course rifampin based in this uh, instance uh, regimen uh, and showed that uh, the school children who uh, received uh, TB preventive therapy had extremely low rates of TB compared to those who uh, elected not to choose uh, TB preventive therapy, but that uh, overall the incidence of TB uh, disease over three years with this intervention uh, declined by uh, uh, almost 90% and the prevalence of TB infection uh, significantly declined as well. So this is all just uh, demonstrating that at the population level, treating TB infection uh, and those at highest risk uh, pays real benefits. So <clears throat> in conclusion and in summary, TB preventive therapy works and it's necessary to end the TB epidemic. 
uptake of TB preventive therapy has been poor, especially among contacts, but the newer short course regimens uh, have the potential to greatly increase the use uh, of TPT in high risk populations. GHP is very easy, safe, and effective. 1-HP is even easier, safe, and effective. And shorter, more potent regimens uh, that may work for all TB, such as with the uh, are in development, and a long-acting injectable is uh, very promising. So I'll end there and uh, thank my colleagues uh, at Johns Hopkins, the Perinatal HIV Research Unit, the ACTG, the Impact 4TB Group, the TBTC, and our funders, uh, who um, uh, shared in uh, producing the work that I uh, am showing you today. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to participate in this World TB Day conference. I'd like to thank the conference organizers and also to wish my very best to people in Thailand and online who are joining this important conference. Today, I'm gonna to be sharing with you some perspectives on tuberculosis preventative therapy and discuss some research and our experiences in Vietnam treating latent tuberculosis infection. And I'd particularly like to acknowledge the Vietnam National Tuberculosis Program with whom we've conducted this research. You would all be familiar with the NTB strategy of the World Health Organization, which aims to reach TB elimination by the middle of the century with a reduction by 2035 shown here. Now, one of the challenges that was faced even before COVID-19 was the very slow reduction with business as usual, just a 1.5% reduction per year. The COVID pandemic has put this back even further However, the principle still applies, which is that we need new tools and new strategies if we're going to rapidly reduce the uh, rate of tuberculosis globally. And for this reason, we need to do more than business as usual. That is, in high burden countries, we need to do more than treating tuberculosis disease when it occurs. With that in mind, the World Health Organization and many national tuberculosis programs are increasingly recognizing the importance of latent tuberculosis infection as a part of this strategy. Latent tuberculosis infection is caused by Mycobacterium tuberculosis, which causes an immune reaction that can then be measured. The uh, reaction, uh, which may be measured by a tuberculin skin test or an interferon gamma release assay, shows infection, but there's no evidence of disease. This is a little bit like hypertension or hypercholesterolemia in relation to heart disease. That is, it's a risk factor which is modifiable and indicates an increased risk of progression, but doesn't indicate that a person will certainly progress to the disease. And similar to hypertension or hypercholesterolemia, we need to be looking at strategies to address that risk factor in order to progress the disease outcome. On the other end of the spectrum, Active tuberculosis is a disease that affects primarily the lungs, that affects both the individual themselves, but also is able to be spread through the air to other people. And for this reason, the treatment of latent tuberculosis infection can also have public health benefits as well as individual benefits by preventing transmission of tuberculosis in the future. It's increasingly recognized, however, that there's not a binary state between active tuberculosis and latent TB infection, that in fact, it's probably a spectrum that has several stages. And these intermediate stages, such as incipient tuberculosis, where there may be some metabolic activity uh, of the bacterium, and subclinical disease, where there may also be measurable radiological or microbiological evidence, these states are likely to precede active tuberculosis disease. And there's been some interesting work done, particularly in South Africa, looking at biomarkers which can predict progression to active disease and indicate these states, although the significance of these states is still being evaluated through research. We know that latent tuberculosis infection is particularly common amongst some high-risk populations. Most uh, 
characteristic of this is the contact population, that is, people who've been exposed to patients who have active tuberculosis. We conducted a meta-analysis of 135 studies, including almost a half a million people who were tested for latent TB infection. These were contacts of patients with known tuberculosis. And we found amongst those contacts that the pool prevalence of latent TB was 42.4% with significant heterogeneity. And interestingly, the prevalence was highest in countries that have been classified as low or low middle income countries. Uh, and the uh, prevalence of latent TB infection was highest amongst countries where the incidence of tuberculosis was also high. So this indicates that close contacts are a high risk population particularly in high incidence countries, and therefore this population may benefit from treatment to prevent the progression from latent TB to active TB. Our meta-analysis also demonstrated that the timing of this incidence is likely to be soon after the initial exposure. So when we looked at the pooled incidence against time, you can see on this graph here, that most of the incident disease occurred within the first two years after exposure to the index patient. And so this is an indication that tuberculosis prevention is most likely to be beneficial in people who have been recently exposed. So what is currently the state of play in terms of latent TB infection treatment? Well, amongst the global burden of latent TB, which is thought to affect around one in four people globally, a very small proportion are able to access treatment. This figure here is an indication uh, that less than 5% of all people with latent TB infection are likely to be treated currently, and that there's a huge opportunity for us to scale up treatment. Current WHO guidelines, which were most recently updated in 2018, offer a number of antibiotic combinations which are useful for treating latent TB infection. And these are being increasingly scaled up in countries such as Vietnam. Some of the options, which have been based on randomised trial data, include six to nine months of isoniazid monotherapy, or rifampicin plus isoniazid for three months, three months of weekly isoniazid and rifapentine, which is a longer-acting rifamycin drug. And in low-incidence settings, a number of other combinations are, are offered. And in fact, three to four months of rifampicin therapy, which is uh, based on uh, a clinical trial uh, by Menzies et al., that was published after the guidelines were released, uh, shows us that four months of rifampicin therapy is also effective, as effective as nine months of isoniazid. One of the challenges, though, is that we don't yet have the results from randomised trials looking at contacts of patients with drug-resistant disease. And so currently WHO guidelines offer a cautious approach, which is individualised risk assessment for drug-resistant TB infection. So for the remainder of the talk today, I'm going to share insights from two of our trials in Vietnam that we've done in partnership with the Vietnam National Tuberculosis Program with the University of Sydney and the Wilcock Institute of Medical Research. The first addresses this question about how can preventive therapy be implemented in high incidence settings? How do we translate those WHO guidelines into practice? And so I'm going to talk about the ACT4 trial, which was a multi-country trial of which Vietnam was one participant site. And secondly, what is effective for treating latent TB infection that is multi-drug resistant? And this is a subject of a clinical trial that is nearing completion, the VQIN MDR trial. So I'll begin with the ACT4 trial, which was a cluster randomized control trial that aimed to evaluate the effectiveness and the cost effectiveness of a health systems intervention for treating latent TB infection. And uh, Professor Dick Menzies was the lead international investigator for this study. The premise of this study is the figure shown here, which is from a meta-analysis that indicates that even when programs treat latent TB infection, often only a very small proportion of those treated actually receive therapy. So in this meta-analysis, out of 100% of people who are intended for screening, only around 70% are initially tested. Many uh, don't receive the test result or 
If the test result is positive, they may not be referred. They may not complete the medical evaluation. And so just over a third of these patients who are intended to screen for latent TB infection uh, receive a recommendation of latent TB treatment. Um, of the total uh, who are intended for screening, just around 30% uh, start treatment and many of those don't complete treatment. Uh, so therefore the drop-off is very substantial between the number of people who are intended for screening and the number of people who actually start and then complete treatment for latent TB. So this cascade analysis demonstrates that at each of these steps there are important opportunities to reduce the progression, uh, to reduce the, the, um, the drop-off and therefore increase the uptake of the um, treatment for latent TB infection. And so you can see, therefore, if we go right down, that just 18.8% of people at the moment, according to this meta-analysis of multiple studies internationally, completed treatment. So the ACT4 study was a cluster randomized trial where the clusters were basic health units, such as TB clinics. And it was conducted in Canada, in Vietnam, in Benin, in Ghana, and in Indonesia. There were two phases. The first was a standardized public health evaluation which was a process of developing a local approach to TB preventive therapy. The second was implementing these solutions in the form of a cluster randomized trial. There were several phases. The first was a process of evaluating the program. We used a combination of quantitative measures to create our own local cascade of care and questionnaires for stakeholders such as healthcare workers to understand the losses at each step of the cascade. This resulted in a discussion with the programs and um, a series of stakeholder meetings, which were then reviewed and developed a series of approaches to go and uh, implement latent TB therapy. And finally, this led to the health system strengthening intervention where we applied these within the programs. And then we used the cascade approach, which is measuring the different stages of the cascade of care that I showed you to look at how effective that was being. And the outcome was the number of index patients with TB um, who were documented and the number of household contacts who were identified and started on treatment in the final six months of the study. And at each stage, we conducted an assessment of costs uh, in order to look at the costs of doing this in a programmatic setting. The publication that uh, arose from this is uh, Oxlade et al. in Lancet Public Health last year. So there were 24 clusters included, of which 12 were randomised to the control and 12 to the intervention. And we screened a total of 1,043 index patients with TB in the control clusters and 1,026 index patients with TB in the intervention clusters. And around 1,400 contacts uh, in the control clusters and over 2,000 contacts in the uh, intervention clusters. This is a description of some of the sites. So you'll see here there's a range of both low and high incidence settings and public hospitals, public TB clinics and primary care uh, clinics in different countries. Within Vietnam, this is a map of these sites that we conducted the study in. And so you can see here that the yellow represents the intervention sites and the green represents control sites with the red representing the sites for the pilot study initially. So what we found during the first phase was that there was minimal knowledge about latent TB infection, both in the general community and also within the healthcare worker population. That there was a lack of recognition that latent TB infection infection was an important priority for the contacts of index patients with TB and it was considered that TB screening for active disease was more important and this is a common perception in many countries. We found at the baseline when we did the baseline cascade of care that of a thousand contacts that were estimated to be eligible for screening hardly any around six commenced on latent TB treatment. And this was in a setting where paediatric latent TB therapy was the national program, uh, but adults were not routinely treated. So this indicates that the biggest gap was in identifying eligible contacts. And so this needed to be the starting point. 
that once we had closed this gap, it would be then obvious or more obvious what the other barriers were in the cascade. So you can see here as an illustration of the cascade approach, which I think is very useful for programs. So what you do is you have a series of steps where you're collecting programmatic data routinely, and this allows you to map uh, what the different um, progression points are through this cascade. So starting off with contact um, numbers, the numbers are identified, the numbers who start uh, assessment, the numbers who complete assessment, the numbers who are referred after being assessed and found to have latent TB for medical evaluation for treatment, the proportion who complete that evaluation, and then are commenced on uh, latent TB therapy after being recommended. So there are many steps in this cascade and, and the study aimed to go and uh, address each of those steps. So the second gap uh, was the starting of treatment, but that is not the, the main gap. And as I said, we needed to identify, first of all, the solutions to the first gap before we could identify what were the barriers in the second step. The interventions that we designed in Vietnam, based upon those data that I mentioned, include the development of health educational material for the community regarding relating TB infection, which can be offered uh, at the point of contact investigation. We organ organised training for healthcare workers about latent TB infection management. We restructured contact management uh, so that we were able to deliver it at healthcare facilities. Previously, healthcare workers had gone to households uh, and this had been a big barrier because of the, um, the limited uh, time that people had to do this. And, uh, and also the expertise uh, lay primarily within the TB program rather than in the, the community workers. So we, um, we developed a process of household visits to go and invite people to, uh, to attend screening and then um, developed a registry which was based in the clinics so that they could write the data themselves and then report through to the, the, um, the research um, leaders about their progress regularly. And we conducted in-service training which included um, an experienced tuberculosis physician visiting the district clinics and educating the staff about the study and also about latent TB. And this was a really important part of the process to go and identify what were the local questions and the local gaps. This is an example of the material that was used. So this is in English, but it was translated into Vietnamese. Um, information about what is latent TB, um, information about TB uh, occurring more, more often in context, um, and who should be tested for it, uh, what was the treatment that was available, uh, and uh, that it was free of charge to be screened and treated for latent TB infection in these clinics. We also had some guidance for how to produce sputum um, and some information for those who started on latent TB treatment about what happened if they missed a dose and how to um, manage adverse events. The Vietnamese experience uh, included in-service training twice a month for the first month and then once every month after that. You can see here in the other countries that there were different schedules of in-service training based on the local needs and resources. Now this is a figure that shows the Vietnamese sites against some of the other countries in the study. The red indicates the baseline, which is phase one uh, in the intervention and phase one and phase two in control. And you see here before or without the intervention, the average number of household contacts identified per index patient, which is the, um, the y-axis, was very small. And you can see particularly in the high incidence countries in Benin, uh, in Indonesia and Ghana and Vietnam, that there was an increase in the number of contacts identified uh, compared to before the intervention. So Vietnam is particularly striking, and this was partly because the program at the time had screen children only, and we expanded this to screening adults. But you can see that uh, that the performance of Vietnam is comparable with that of, uh, of the other settings. And uh, in, in this particular setting, the number of householders on average um, was between two and three. And so this is very reassuring that we, we have a high participation rate of uh, people in contact investigation. Um, you can see here an example before the, um, before the intervention period uh, of the cascade of care, and this was presented to the programs in a graph form like this. And then we used this to have discussions with them about how to improve uh, participation. And then after the strengthening phase, you can see how 
at each stage of these seven steps that there had been substantial improvement. So what did the study show overall? Well, overall across the 24 sites, you can see that the proportion of household contacts initiating preventive therapy in the control group was about 0.28 um, and it was 0.35 um, in the intervention group. So there was an increase. Um, if you look in the Canadian sites, um, that in fact uh, the control sites um, did uh, uh, better, it seems, than the intervention sites. And uh, when you looked at the, um, the data, you can see there wasn't uh, much difference between them in terms of the younger children, and uh, there seemed to be um, a bigger difference. And it's interesting, it, it may well be um, a random variation rather than that, that the, uh, the intervention actually caused a decline here. Um, if you look at the low and middle income countries, however, you can see the opposite. You can see that uh, in the control sites at the last six months, uh, about 0.14 um, uh, per hundred, like as in 14% of people um, had uh, had been able to initiate preventive therapy, whereas 52% um, of people in the intervention groups had been able to initiate preventive therapy. So this is in the control on the left and the intervention on the right. And you can see that that held for both under fives and also over fives. And so this indicates that in Canada, which was a site which has been doing preventive therapy for many years, that this intervention didn't really increase um, further. And in fact, if anything, there was an imbalance in favor of the control group. Whereas uh, from the low middle income countries where there was a high burden and, and limited uh, baseline use of latent TB therapy, that there was a substantial improvement. And so um, if you then look at uh, all countries and it's adjusted uh, based upon um, a number of factors, um, you can see that in the in all countries overall, um, that the difference between phase one and phase two, um, uh, so you can see here um, 72, um, which is uh, with 95% confidence limits of 10 to 134, per 100 index patients, patients commenced on treatment. So overall, the intervention was effective. But then if you look down here uh, for those um, low and middle income countries, you see that the benefit was around 104 people per 100 index patients. And so this is a substantial increase. Okay, from a 20 uh, difference between intervention and control to 84 um, increase between intervention and control. So, in summary, a package of interventions to strengthen screening for TB preventive therapy increased the proportion of people who start TB therapy, and there was a greater effect seen in lower middle income countries. And this is an example of a method that could be used in many other countries, including Thailand, to um, scale up latent TB therapy. And the methods uh, are described in the paper that I've, I've mentioned already by um, Olivia Oxlade and Dick Menzies et al. In the remaining few minutes, I'm going to talk about a second study that we're conducting in Vietnam, which is to look at preventive therapy for drug-resistant tuberculosis. This is the VQIN MDR trial, and it is supported by the Australian government and run in, in partnership with the Vietnam National Tuberculosis Program. Drug-resistant TB is a challenge in many countries. Vietnam has a high prevalence, um, but also you can see in many other parts of uh, Southeast Asia, um, that there are high rates of, um, of MDR-TB or multi-drug resistant TB. Drug resistant TB is not just a problem that occurs in TB patients, however, it arises in the community. It occurs when people use antibiotics inappropriately or uh, use monotherapy particularly that can select for resistant strains. And also preventive therapy um, is, has an important role once people do get infected. Um, the reason I've got the pictures here of the marketplaces and villages is that much of the transmission of drug-resistant TB goes on in the community. And so after a person uh, with drug-resistant TB uh, coughs and infects somebody else, that person may then have infection due to drug-resistant TB. And the challenge is that the standard therapies that we use to treat latent TB are unlikely to be effective in people who have infection with drug-resistant TB. So prevention is obviously very important both prevention of drug resistance in the first place, prevention of susceptibility to getting uh, TB disease, and also preventive therapy to prevent latent TB infection from becoming active TB. We really need to learn more about 
how to prevent drug resistant TB because drug resistant TB is very costly um, uh, uh, because of the, not just the cost of the drugs, but also the impact upon patients and their families who have to miss work and, um, and you know, have frequent encounters with the healthcare system. It's also um, an area where there's a huge number of gaps. And you can see listed here um, a research agenda for many areas of drug resistant TB which need research. And one of them at the bottom there is preventive therapy. Up to now, there haven't been any randomized trial data to inform what is the most appropriate therapy for treating drug resistant TB. This is a picture of a child in one of our clinics in Vietnam participating in the VQIN study. And so this was a programmatic randomized trial where we implemented within the TB program a process of screening for latent TB infection and then treating patients uh, who had latent TB infection. The choice of antibiotics was based upon some observational studies from countries such as Micronesia and South Africa, which showed promise in relation to the use of fluoroquinolone therapy. And so therefore we use levofloxacin as the active drug against a placebo. The VQIN trial is one of three trials. There's another called TB Champ, which is underway in South Africa, and a larger study called Phoenix study using delaminid, um, which is underway internationally. So the VQIN study was conducted across Vietnam in 10 different provinces that you can see listed there within the National Tuberculosis Program. And we gave six months of daily levofloxacin at standard doses against placebo and then followed people up for a total of 30 months after enrollment. The study has recruited 2,000 people um, and we are expecting follow-up to be completed in March 2022. The final results will be available, we hope, later this year and will provide the first data about the effectiveness of preventive therapy for drug-resistant tuberculosis. And we're looking forward to sharing those results once they're available. So it's important to acknowledge all of the uh, researchers who've been involved from the National Tuberculosis Program, and you can see a number of them here. Particularly, um, like to acknowledge uh, Dr. Bing Nguyen, who is uh, the project coordinator for the VQIN study, and also the other staff from the National Tuberculosis Program including Professor Nguyen Viet Nhung, the director of the National Tuberculosis Program. And this is the staff of the Warcock Institute, uh, which is one of the partners implementing this study. You can see here many of the people who've contributed to the research that I've uh, described. And I'd like to acknowledge Professor Guy Marx, who's a research leader uh, with our group, uh, who's also uh, been uh, central to our research in Vietnam, uh, and also colleagues, Professor Dick Menzies and, and Professor Marcel Baer from McGill University. And as I mentioned, a number of um, senior leaders in the Vietnam National Tuberculosis Program, particularly Professor Nguyen Viet Nhung. And I'd like to also acknowledge the TB program staff in the many provinces in which we've conducted this study. Thank you again for the opportunity to share our research with you today, and I wish you all the best on World TB Day. So I would like to thank uh, all the uh, both two speakers for their wonderful talk and also very, very inspiring talk. So uh, because of the time uh, uh, constraints, so, so I just would like to wrap up and just a summary and it will be uh, uh, in Thai. So, who was the time? So, 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 อ่าจริงๆแล้วเนี่ยมากกว่า 70% อ่าเสนอว่าอย่างกรณีที่รีโวทอกซิซิตอนนี้เราก็ไม่ยาวใหม่แล้วถึงซึ่งในหนูแล้วเนี่ยโพมิซิ่งมากก็คือการฉีดยาอ่าเบตาคารีนอ่าในการป้องกันอ่าหนูเนี่ยก็ป้องกันมะเร็งโรคนะคะซึ่งต่
บางกะสงสัยว่ามันจะเอฟเฟกตีฟหรือเปล่ามันจะป้องกันได้ไหมอ่าถ้าให้ TPT ไปแล้วจะป้องกันรีอิฟเฟคชันได้ไหมโดยเฉพาะในคนไข้ HIV ตรงนี้ก็สรุปก็คือว่าการให้รีไซเคิล TPT เนี่ยไม่ได้ไม่ได้มีประโยชน์เพิ่มขึ้นนะฮะแต่ในคนไข้ HIV ถ้าเราให้ TPT คู่กับยาต้านมันก็จะทำให้ลดการเกิด Active TB ได้ถึง 95% ได้เลยนะคะแล้วก็ยาต้านตอนนี้ให้ได้เกือบทุกตัวแล้วก็ DTG ซึ่งเป็นยาใหม่เนี่ยสามารถที่ให้กับ 3HP ได้นะคะนี่ข้อมูลจาก Dolphin t r i a ไม่ต้องเพิ่มเดวสนะถึงแม้ระดับยาจะลดลง 30% แต่ว่าระดับยาก็เหนือกว่าเหนือกว่าปริมาณที่ที่จะฆ่าเชื้อ TB HV ได้นะคะอาจจะดี A 5 3 7 2เนี่ยก็จะโชว์ว่าการให้วัน HP กับ DTG safe นะคะตอนนี้ยังให้เป็น50มิลลิกรัม BID ในสตีนี้อยู่แต่ว่าดูจากระดับยาแล้วเนี่ยระดับยามันสูงกว่าที่ให้ OD dose ของ DTG เนี่ยค่อนข้างอพอพอสมควรเพราะฉะนั้นจริงๆแล้วเราคิดว่าไม่จำเป็นต้องเพิ่มขนาดยาเหมือนกันนะคะแต่ว่ารอดูสตีรีเซลก่อนนะของ A 5 3 7 2ใน next phase นะทีนี้อันนี้กรณีที่ lack of understanding impact on TB dynamic ตัวนี้เขาก็เขาก็ example เนี่ยค่อนข้างดีมากเลยว่ามันสามารถที่จะเบนเดอะเคิร์ฟเนี่ยของของ TB incident ได้ไม่ว่าจะเป็นที่ Alaska หรือไม่ว่าจะเป็น zero TB kiss ในอินเดียนะคะหรือว่า homeless ใน Seattle นะคะเพราะฉะนั้นจริงๆแล้วการให้ TPT เนี่ยมีประโยชน์นะคะทีนี้มาตรง contact case เนี่ยก็จะเห็นว่ามันจะสูงมากในประเทศที่เป็น low หรือ low middle income country ใช่ไหมโอกาสที่จะเจออินซิเดนต์ LTBI ก็จะสูงแล้วก็ในกรณีที่เป็น high TB setting นะคะเพราะฉะนั้นโอกาสก็จะสูงขึ้นอันนี้ตามตามนี้ได้เลยนะคะเพราะฉะนั้น WHO เองเนี่ยแนะนำอยู่3กลุ่มนะคะที่ควรจะให้ TPT กลุ่มแรกก็คือ HIV อันนี้ไม่มีข้อโต้แย้งนะคะดิกาฟเลตกับ CD4 นะคะแล้วก็ในกลุ่มที่2คือ household contact นะคะแล้วก็กลุ่มอีกกลุ่มหนึ่งก็คือ auto risk ก็เช่นพวกให้ anti TNF t r e a t m e n t ซึ่งวันนี้ดีใจมากเลยนะคะที่อาจารย์เจริญก็ endorse การให้ TPT โดยเฉพาะในใน3กลุ่มนี้นะคะแล้วก็ professor fox ก็ show ให้เราเห็นเรื่องเรื่อง the act โปรไทน์ในเวียดนามซึ่งก็จะสามารถแอพพลายในประเทศได้เช่นกันนะฮะทีนี้ขออัปเดต HIV ไกด์ไลน์อันใหม่นิดนึงก็คือว่าเราอยากจะให้คนไข้ HIV ทุกคนเนี่ยได้รับ TPT นะโดยเฉพาะคนที่ได้ยาต้านมาภายใน12เดือนแรกเดิมเป็น6เดือนตอนนี้เปลี่ยนเป็น12เดือนแรกนะคะก็คือ1ปีแรก CD4 น้อยกว่า200ไม่ต้องตรวจ k c หรือ i อกนะฮะถ้า CD4 มากกว่า200ถ้าทีไซซีบวกหรือ positive ไอกล้าให้แต่ถ้าไม่สามารถมีทีไซซีหรือไอกล้าก็สามารถให้ได้เหมือนกันนะคะก็คุย risk กับ benefit กับคนไข้ close contact ให้ไม่สนใจทีไซซีหรือไอกล้านะฮะทีนี้ regimen จาก WHO ตามนี้ได้เลยนะคะทีนี้จากตัวที่ตัว one HP เนี่ยก็อยู่ใน WHO ไกด์ไลน์แล้วจะเป็น alternative นะคะเพราะว่าไม่มีข้อมูลในใน h อใน non HIV จะมีข้อมูลเฉพาะในใน HIV นะคะทีนี้ไกด์ไลน์ของประเทศไทยเราแนะนำตัวไหนนะคะเนื่องจากว่า cost มันค่อนข้างสูงเพราะฉะนั้นเราแนะนำา i s o l i s i s l i f a p e n t i n e weekly ตอนนี้ของอกระทรวงเนี่ยมีแบบ f i x dose combination นะคะซึ่งสามารถให้ได้ง่ายนะั่นคือ3เม็ดอ่าวิกลี่นะคะก็จะง่ายขึ้นนะคะแล้วก็อันนึงคืออยากจะเน้นว่าอยากจะให้ดูน้ําหนักตัวด้วยเป็นอย่างที่อาจารย์เจริญเน้นก็คือว่าถ้าน้ําหนักตัวน้อยควรจะลดขนาดยาเพราะโอกาสเกิดท็อกซิสตี้จะสูงขึ้นนะคะมันอีกส่วนหนึ่งก็คือเป็นบัน HP ตรงนี้ถ้าไม่สามารถจะให้ไรฟ้าเป็นยีนได้ก็ให้เป็นไอโซสิสามร้อยอันนี้คือเฉพาะ HIV นะคะเพราะฉะนั้นในนี้ผลข้างเคียงก็ตามนี้แล้วก็ริสก์ของไฮเปอร์เซนซิฟิตี้เยอะก็จะเป็นผู้หญิงนะคะแล้วก็อายุมากกว่า35ปีหรือหนักน้อยทีนี้มีสตีของประเทศไทยเองเนี่ยเราก็มีเปรียบเทียบบัลลิสพีกับ t r i s h p ใน15โรงพยาบาลนะคะโซฟาตอนนี้ก็คือว่าเรายังไม่เจอคนไข้ที่เป็น Active TB หรือว่าเสียชีวิตนะคะจากคนไข้ทั้งหมดประมาณ860คนนะคะก็ต้องรอข้อมูลที่เพิ่มขึ้นที่เราเจอเนี่ยก็คือเป็นอะซิโนมาติก ALT elevation เนี่ย
ประมาณ 4% อย่างที่อาจารย์พูดเมื่อเช้าว่าถ้าไม่มีอาการก็ไม่ควรจะตรวจนะกลุ่มนี้ก็คือส่วนใหญ่จะไม่ค่อยมีอาการนะฮะแล้วก็สรุปก็คือว่าเนื่องจากว่าถ้าเราไม่รักษาเลเชนทีบีคนไข้จะเป็นแอคทีฟทีบีมาเรื่อยๆเพราะฉะนั้นก็จะวนลูปเพราะฉะนั้นอยากจะให้ทําทั้งสามสถิจีนะก็คือค้นหาอ่าแล้วก็รักษาแล้วก็พรีเวนชั่นนะคะแล้วก็สูตรที่คิดว่าง่ายก็คืออ่อาวันเอชพหรือสามเอชพแต่วันเอชพง่ายตรงที่ว่าพอจะเกิดไซเอฟเฟกเนี่ยที่ที่เรามาสลับที่หนึ่งเดือนเนี่ยก็หยุดยาพอดีเลยเช่นเอลทีขึ้นไม่ต้องคิดมากแล้วก็หยุดหยุดยาแล้วก็เป็นเป็นสันดาดโดสก็คือโดสไม่ได้สูงมากเพราะเท่าที่ดูเนี่ยคนไข้ HPV จะชอบวัน HP มากกว่า3 HP แล้วก็โอกาสลืมก็จะน้อยกว่าที่เป็นวิกฤตด้วยนะคะก็ขอบคุณค่ะ